the, this future proofing your land forum is the first of a, a series of events that Geelong Land Care Network uh, are planning to run under the banner of farming for our future. Um, land care has always been about uh, looking after the ecology, planting trees, protecting remnants and fencing off waterways. Um, in this program, we're going uh, a little further uh, down and looking into how and why we should enhance ecology uh, in our production systems to regenerate soils and our landscapes. Um, the first event, we look at uh, the principles of ecological production and how this type of system might fit into your operation as well as the economics of doing so. Um, so without too much further ado, um, I'd like to uh, just acknowledge that our uh, guest speaker today is uh, Dr. Wendy Seabrook, and she's um, the author of this fine publication here that uh, I picked up and um, uh, I knew nothing about Wendy before I bought this, and I, I think that this handbook is one of the, the, the best uh, resources that there is around for people who are, are new to the area of um, ecological agriculture. Some might call it uh, regenerative agriculture. Um, so it's, uh, it's a great book, and it's well worth picking up. All right, um, so Dr. Wendy Seabrook is the founder and director of Learning From Nature, author of the Ecological Farming Handbook and the Ecological Gardening Handbook, uh, and manager of Hilltop Farm, the demonstration site and education centre uh, for learning from nature. Over the last 20 years, Dr. Seabrook has partnered with organisations like the Royal Society for the, the Protection of Birds in the UK, Worldwide Fund for Nature, the Seychelles Island Foundation, Queensland Department of Environment and Land Care Australia in the design and delivery of programs supporting conservation and regenerative agriculture outcomes. Her workshops have featured on ABC Country Hour and Radio National Nights in New Zealand, and Learning From Nature was selected as a finalist in the 2016 Australian Future Agro Challenge. Wendy's got a, um, a very long list of qualifications, a PhD in ecology and uh, uh, several other qualifications in both ecology and permaculture. She has been a land care coordinator, a catchment coordinator, organic farmer and uh, several other positions, including uh, research positions. So without any further ado, I will now hand over to Dr. Wendy Seabrook. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you, Peter. I'll share the screen. Peter, thank you for the introduction. And, um, and people who are online, thank you for sharing a little bit about yourself. I mean, Peter's given me a pretty good introduction. But I think, yeah, I'd like to just sort of yeah, emphasize that um, uh, the information that I'm sharing tonight has really come from a journey that started about 10 years ago. Um, I, you know, I, I've spent the last few decades working as a land care coordinator, catchment coordinator. And it was, it was a sort of desire to get more involved with sort of applying. I was a, involved in ecological research and um, but what I was frustrated with was, was how little of it was actually applied in the field and, um, and wanting to get some really, some good stuff happening across our agricultural landscape. And, you know, I look back now and to be honest, I sort of think how, how did I spend so long sort of focused on sustaining, on sustainable agriculture? Because when I moved up to here, I'm based in Cooktown, which is um, north of Cairns. It's a wet, dry tropics. I, um, I decided that I wanted to bring in and, and explore ways of bringing in my background in ecology more into the way that I was growing on my own farm. 
And then I started to pick up some of the benefits that farmers were getting from using regenerative practices. And, and then you start to realize, my God, you know, we've spent all this time basically, and me included, um, putting a lot of effort into sustaining uh, soils and other aspects of our farms and gardens that are actually in need of repair. And, and so from that, and that realization and some light bulb moments and seeing, you know, the amazing uh, op opportunities we have now to sort of see what people are doing in various parts of the world, courtesy of, of platforms like YouTube and, you know, conferences online, starting to see some of the benefits that other growers were getting, but then sort of saying, okay, this is regenerative agriculture, um, but how are they doing it? And, and coming so often back to just seeing that regenerative act agriculture is a series of practices, whether it's no-till or agroforestry or cover crops. And, and I started to experiment with things and, and I realized that I needed to know why these things worked because in understanding why they that worked, I could then apply them to my own conditions. And really, so this talk tonight, Future Proof Your Land, Regenerating the Ecological Functions in Your Production Systems is, is what has come from that journey. And the wonderful thing, so as I think as Peter said, that this is about ecological principles. And often when we say the word principles, people go, oh my God, that sounds complicated. But the wonderful thing is, is, that, is that when we delve deep and look at what's underlying what we do and the reasons why things work, the story is quite straightforward. And that's what I hope to show you um, in this talk. And, and, and as part of the, the evening, we're also going to explore ways that we can apply those principles um, in, in what, what you do in your farms and gardens. So, you know, faced with escalating costs and extreme weather, it feels like we are running out of options. But there is a practical solution. And, you know, when we look at our farms, auditing our farms, um, and I'm talking here about, I'm going to talk a lot about, the use the word production system. So, um, but what I want you to think about that if you're a gardener or if you're, um, uh, you know, you've got a, a, a few acres and you're, you're not, you, your goal isn't to, to be a commercial producer. It might be to grow things for your own families or it might be to grow a bit extra for the, for the, you know, the farmer's market or even just to run some horses on your land. But you're still producing something. You're still uh, doing this, a whole lot of different things to produce an outcome at the end. So auditing our farms, so auditing our properties, we look, at, we look generally at getting the best outcomes for, from you know, looking at production costs, uh, looking at our over costs, you know, the, the, um, the money that we owe to the bank and our non-operating costs. But like any other business, so or like, um, you know, and I'm sorry, I'm using the word business in this case, we look for ways to get our production systems working better. And in principle, a production system on a farm, on a property is no different from a production system that's producing car parts or um, chocolate coated biscuits. Um, there is raw materials that we use, um, what we put into the system, and then we use labor, our labor, equipment, machinery to perform different functions to get the outcome that we're after. So we have our labor and our the energy that we put in and other inputs to produce the um, products and services that we want at the end. So production systems on farms are really no different. As you can see here, I've just highlighted some of the raw materials. So we're looking, for example, at seeds, seedlings, wieners, grafted fruit trees, etc. The same thing, you know, we're looking at using the, 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 our labor and equipment and machinery to perform different processes to get the outcome that we want of and the quality of produce that we want. The issue is that um, the production systems on, on our farms have, have been generally, while they've been generally maintained, there is one aspect 
that that we have haven't well maintained and in fact over the years we've mostly overlooked an essential the, these essential ecological components um, to the extent that we've often neglected them and they're not working as well as they 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 ca can potentially do so we've forgotten about the the services, the ecological services that they naturally provide. So consequently, like any business carrying out interim repairs, our production costs increase as the underlying problems mount up. And we see this, particularly in our broad acre or in our agricultural systems, we see that the costs of, our, of labor, of energy, the equipment that we need, the fertilizers, the pest controls and other inputs are going up. And when conditions are a bit challenging, there's, a, there's an issue with, with the yields that we get and the quality of the products that we get. When we look back from, in, a, in a way from the future, at the moment we talk, we use the term conventional agriculture, conventional grower to distinct growing, sorry, to distinguish between um, the, the, the synthetic chemical approach and the organic biodynamic approach. But I think people will look back from the future and say what was conventional was substituting for these free ecological services. And ecosystems and ecology can get very complex. But my, what I've done over the last few years with, with the research has, what I've done is, is is basically identified crucial ecological components that are lacking from our production systems or are no longer in good working order in our production systems, in our gardens, gardens and farms. The first one is recycling nutrients. And so that is the soil's ability to, to use the organic materials that, that we that are, are fed into the soil, whether above the soil or in terms of roots and root exudates, which are the sugars that plants put out through their roots. It's their ability to be able to, or the soil ecosystem's ability to be able to break that organic materials down and release that, those nutrients in them and feed them back to the plants when, as and when those plants require. The other one is related to our water cycle. And, you know, water cycles are huge, but there is a part of the, the small part of the water cycle, which, which is about the recycling and storing of water in our soil and vegetation. Capturing more solar energy, the, the solar panels, the, 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 um, the, our plants and our leaves through photosynthesis capture solar energy. And I think people are more aware of this now, but for many, many years, when I look back, the focus has always been, how can I increase production? How can I grow more? And the focus has been on nutrients, but like our plants, like us, they need solar energy as well as nutrients. And the last point is creating beneficial connections to use these, this energy and nutrients more efficiently. And in a way that's functional biodiversity. And, you know, I talk to a lot of um, mainstream farmers. And if you mention biodiversity, they, people tend to think, oh, God, you know, we, we've got enough problems without the community sort of saying to us, oh, we've got to get more biodiversity in our system as well. But there's a lot of opportunities for farmers to introduce functional biodiversity that has a direct economic benefit to them. So, for example, um, in, in some areas, particularly in Europe, they're now in cropping areas, they're now putting strips across their fields with um, plants specifically there to provide food for the pollinators, to increase their pollination levels in their, in their crops. Other examples about creating pest resistant landscapes. Um, if you're aware of things like cover crops, which is, is the growing of a crop, um, not for food, but um, to provide ecological support, sort of nitrogen fixing, deep rooted, but ecological support services between the cropping cycle. And one of the examples in a really interesting example there is where people are using um, plants like forest sorry, forage radish to um, 
capture some of the new, some of the nitrogen that is in the legumes in their cover crop mix, and to to make that then slowly release that nitrogen, and so it's available for the, the when they plant the next crop in to the into the um, into their system. So moving on, so we've talked about when when there's um, an issue when our production system is not working very well. In this case, we're looking at the fact that our ecological components are not working very well. What also can happen is that there, when there is an extra strain on the system, our production system, I'm sure, you know, Gabe Brown is, is very, I'm hoping you can hear me okay because I've just got a sign saying internet connect, connection unstable. Can you hear me okay? Anybody there? Yeah, 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 it's a little bit scratchy, but. Okay, just let me know if there is a problem, can you? Yeah. So um, Gabe Brown, a very famous regenerative farmer. And if you just, you know, I put that slide up there with a, it's a, um, oh, what are they called? Those ice balls, I forgot. <laughs> um, you know, in, in the hand, I forgot what it's called. My brain's. Hail. Hail, thank you, thank you, Tim. Um, you know, um, Gabe talks about that he took over the, from the ranch from his in-laws and his the soil was really degraded and they had a whole series of, of years, two, two or three years where they, they, really, they lost their whole crop due to hail damage. But I think as you can read there is that, you know, just coming to that realisation that his his what he was trying to sustain was actually in, degraded, in a degraded condition. Closer to home, um, Tim and Karen Wright, they're um, in New South Wales, I think. So they're mainly um, uh, graziers. And um, so, and again here, they um, are saying here, the trouble that they had, they thought they were okay because they had, um, but they re then realized um, the, um, the condition that their land was in it, that they need to regenerate it. So let's have a look at some examples of farmers who are getting those ecological components in their production systems working better. And, you know, if you if you are, if there are gardeners in this audience, it, it really doesn't matter what size property you have. Um, and it, it also doesn't matter if you understand the principles, it also doesn't matter what climate you work in. I mean, I'm in the wet, dry tropics, but I do workshops and webinars for people in the UK, for example. The, princ the principles are the same. So just ha but the interesting thing is, is that um, a lot of these farmers, when you talk to them, and, and I, some of you may be aware of, of Charles Massey, um, he talks about when he was doing his PhD on regenerative agriculture, he interviewed a whole lot of farmers and the ones that um, had really sort of embraced change were the ones where the shit had hit the fan, where their backs were up against the wall and they needed to do something different. So Colin Sice, um, Australian, um, and again, some of you may um, know of him. His uh, what he he has done is um, uh, is 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 a really interesting thing, which is called pasture cropping. And what he does is he um, he directs seeds his cereal crop into his pasture. He uses time controlled grazing, so mob grazing, to at the change of the season to knock back the grasses, and then and then with one pass direct seeds into into those pastures. And now um, talking to Colin quite recently, you know, one of the things that he's really enjoying experimenting with is actually growing a mixture of crops in his, in his production system as well. So he's um, his looking, so we're looking again from the aspect of a production system. So if we look at the savings on his inputs, and as you can read, that he's saving about $80,000 a year. 
And he says a lot of that is about machinery costs, because now instead of having several passes through the field with various bits of machinery, and I'm not a broad acre cropper, so it's, it's, I don't have you know, a lot of experience with this. But from what he, is, is he says is that he basically only needs one piece of machinery now. And you can read what the the other way he's the other ways he's reduced his his costs on you know fertilizer and herbicide and insecticide use. His yields. So as he said, when he first changed to pasture cropping, his yields were lower. But he's until his his soil health improved, but it's they're now similar, as he says, to high input agriculture. But the thing to remember too is is that so while his crop yields were lower, his costs were also lower. He's he's now running more livestock and he's got better quality wool. And that you start to pick up with with people who are adopting these regenerative approaches is that the income streams, that they gain extra income streams. And in this case, Colin is actually now um, selling native grass seed. So resilience, um, his, um, and, and I think this is what's lovely about um, these farmers who, who are, um, I suppose, some of the leading lights in the regenerative field. Part of the reason is, is because they've got the data. And that's, that's really important for me is I, I want to show people the evidence that if we improve, if we regenerate and if we bring back these ecological components, these are the, 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 the economic benefits and the benefits to our soils and, uh, and you know, sort of things like our pest management programs as well that result and you can see that his organic carbon has increased by by 200 percent and um i'm sure it's i think it's well, well well known now that you know that when we increase the organic carbon the organic amount of carbon in our soil we increase the amount of water that we can store in our soil as well so he's also increased the diversity of native species in his pastures and remember those pastures are, they are permanent pastures. So when he gets into cropping, he's not taking away those pastures. He's not quite taking away that diversity. It's still there. It's just underneath those fast growing pioneering cereal crops. And that's reflected, you know, as, a, as above ground, when we increase the diversity above ground, we also, um, uh, it's reflected in the increase in diversity below ground. And one of the major savings that he has on, on costs is that he doesn't have to drought feed livestock. So Gabe Brown, going back to Gabe Brown, um, he's, he's now diversified into a whole lot of different enterprises. He doesn't use pastured cropping, but <clears throat> interestingly, what he said 20 years ago is he said, how can I mimic what is happening in the native vegetation in my region? And he's in North Dakota and the native vegetation is prairies. So basically a single layer or not, it's more or less a single layer, highly diverse um, forbs, grasses, ecosystem, continuous growth and cover of plants. And, and obviously to, to, initially it would have been managed and grazed by, by bison. So what he's done is he's used mixed cover crops and, and he's using mixed cash crops uh, in rotation. So he's, he's managing his system. So he has living plants for as much of the year as possible. And if you, if you get a chance to see his videos, there's a lovely shot, I think it's like minus 40 degrees centigrade where he's got cows as uh, his cattle, so he's shuff, shoveling their noses through the snow to get to still eat his, his, these cover crops. Um, and, and obviously livestock inter integration into his cropping system. And that's a really important point, um, which I hope I can sort of emphasize again later, is that, you know, we can get a lot of, um, clues on what we should be doing by looking at what the um, architecture of our, our the vegetation in our region or would, would be naturally growing on our land is doing. 
Um, and I can just, I'll just sort of sidetrack a little bit. One of the sort of light bulb moments in my journey was across the road, I'm on red chestnut soil, which is, is, is volcanic soil. It's the, the, um, the farm was originally part of a dairy. Um, it was, and then it was gisted. It was um, used to grow peanuts. And when I bought the soil, the farm about um, 14 years ago, the soil was, you know, intrinsically good, but quite honestly, very worn out. And I remember having some students and I said, let's just go across the road to where there's still some uh, pretty disturbed, but still the native vegetation cover, the native forest cover, rainforest that would have been on my land. And let's have a dig and compare the soil there with the soil on on my land at that time. And and the soil in the rainforest was everything that I wanted. And I had been so working hard, spreading mulch, spreading compost, spreading lime, trying to get that same, um, the same benefits. And so it made me sort of think, how can I design my production system, mimic that architecture, that layered architecture that's happening across the road? And that's sort of been my journey. And just quickly, there's another Another story. These, these, um, uh, this, this story is actually on um, Learning from Nature has a YouTube channel, and um, I've, we've done some of our own videos, but we also collate videos, so it's quite a good resource for people. But there's one video there where um, I think it was one of the first ones that I did, and and I'm in the UK, and um, and I go into an ancient woodland, and um, the boundary. Um, of ancient woodlands is stays very much the same for hundreds of years and this had never been cleared and within 20 meters of the of the edge of the ancient woodland was a, a huge plowed field this is in Cambridgeshire and in the video I show um, the difference between the soil in the ancient woodland and the soil in the in the in the plowed field and the difference is dramatic People often say to me, oh, yes, but we can't grow food in an ancient woodland. And I just say it's not about that. It's about looking at what's happening there that makes what, what are the processes there that are making the difference. So Gabe Brown, he's done some comparisons as well. And um, here we can see a comparison between um, and these are neighboring properties, um, the, the top property is uh, an organic producer and um, you, high diversity of cash crops in rotation. They're not using cover crops, so, so they've got bare ground for part of the year and there's no livestock inter integration, but obviously no, no synthetic chemicals. We've got the other two producers, which are more or less the same. There's just really different in the diversity of cash crops, but again, no livestock integration. Um, and no cover crops. But just look at the difference between the NP, the nitrogen, the, the potassium and the, um, and the phosphorus and the, um, oops, sorry. And the, um, that last column is, the, is a measure of the organic um, carbon in the soil. And I think you can see clearly that there's a huge difference between the brown family's soils and the neighboring soils. And, and so um, the Gabe, Gabe Brown, zero syn synthetics, they're not having to use fertilizers anymore. And I'll, and I'll explain why in a moment. Just looking quickly at resilience and this time in relation to um, drought proofing and making the, the most of rainfall events. Again, we can see a huge difference between the Brown, Brown family's land and the other three properties. And you can see that the Gay Brown is getting much more value from, from each rainfall event. And because the higher organic matter in the soil, that means that obviously that um, they're also storing more of that water. And, and it's an interesting thing, you know, we often have rain gauges and we talk about how much water we're getting in our rain gauge. But I think it's really important that we're also thinking about, does that actually mean that that water is getting into our soil? 
And just quickly, they, they average approximately 30% higher production than um, the, the, the conventional growers do in their surrounding region. And they've generated a whole lot of additional income streams. Closer to home, we mentioned Tim and Karen earlier. Um, they um, got um, into um, wool and beef production, and their main regenerative practice is time controlled grazing. Now, there's all sorts of terms for this. There's, um, you know, holistic plan grazing, which is, uh, you know, it's sort of Alan Savory's um, approach, and, and I use that on this property here, and, and I have seen amazing benefits from doing it. Um, you know, some people would talk about cell grazing, although those tend to be fixed sized paddocks. Um, and uh, I'm trying to think of some other terms, but uh, it, time controlled grazing is, is, a, is a good overall term. And it, it's basically about mimicking the tight mobs of, um, of grazing animals that occur in the wild. Um, when they're surrounded by predators, they feed in dense in dense groups. They eat everything, they shit everything, and they trample, but they move on quickly. And what um, holistic plan people using holistic plan grazing and time control grazing do is mimic that by using electric fencing. So the benefits that they're getting, I'll let you have a read of of, of those. You know, one of the things that Tim says is, you know, it's listed there is that they have fed no hay for 20 to five, 20, 25 to 30 years. And that's that's great in its own. But as he says, that's that means that they don't need a hay shed anymore. You know, so they actually save into on infrastructure. And lastly, I wanted to just talk about. Um, the work that this couple are, are doing. Um, they're not on the property anymore. Um, you can read more about it. Soils for Life have a, have a case study on them. And um, they use time control grazing, but they also use silvio pasture. And if you're not familiar what that is, what that is it's, it's about trees on farms, but it's not just trees um, on the edge of the margins of our, of our paddocks or along the riparian area. It's actually about tr incorporating trees within our pastures. And as, as, um, as they say, that they built an anti-fragile landscape by, bringing, by allowing the brigalow scrub to, to, to regenerate. And it's interesting when you read their story because it was actually, it happened first off because they were, the cost of keeping clearing it was no longer sort of um, economically viable. And that's when they started to pick up that they were actually getting benefits by having some canopy cover. And this is a, this is a nice graph to sort of summarize the difference between um, the Brigalow scrub, the cleared areas where they've got eucalypt uh, forest where there's 90% canopy cover and obviously you know, the canopy cover, the tree canopy cover is so dense that there's probably very little grass growing underneath. But even in the semi, semi evergreen vine thicket, where there's 45% canopy cover, they're still getting higher um, yields than they are in the cleared country. And this is something that um, I've also been doing at Hilltop Farm. It, 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 by, initially by mistake more than anything is that um, planting out some legume trees, Alvesia lebec, and then start noticing that the grass during the dry season was greener under these trees. And when you went and had a look at um, the grass in the middle of the day, the, the grass growing in the full sun would be curled up and no longer photosynthesizing. So no longer, um, capturing solar energy, whereas the grass under the trees was doing so. And um, uh, we've actually um, done some bricks me measurements and, and that backs up our observations on the sugar levels in the leaves. So just to summarize those, some of the benefits that those leading regenerative farmers are getting from basically getting the ecological. 
So they've got improved resource conversion efficiencies, which really means that for the amount of uh, resources that they put in uh, and the cost of those resources that they put in, they get in a they get in a better economic benefit in terms of the yield and the quality of the products. And that's because they've got lower energy, equipment and machinery and other input costs. They often get in higher yields and improve quality. And of course, resilience, to particularly with drought proofing and in, and in terms of pest resistant landscapes. And as we, we, we also saw too, the opportunity to develop extra income streams. So I just wanted just, so just to recap, so we've, we're looking at the, the functions um, performed by different, by these eco, um, functions performed by the ecological components. But what I'd like to do now is just let's delve in a little bit deeper and let's have a look at how to get one of these ecological components actually working better for us. So getting the nutrient cycling system in our soil working better again. So just to summarize, the benefits of having a functioning soil ecosystem is that we get, and I'll just sort of bring the mouse onto the screen there. Can you see them? I hope you see, you see the mouse. Is that we get a soil structure supporting, supporting root growth. And we also get, you know, any, any system obviously gets nutrients from rainwater and dust and, and some from organic matter. But when we have a functioning soil ecosystem, we also get the nutrients from the mineral components in our soil. And this was this is a, a sort of a really, I think, a, a crucial element for us to realize is that that as Elaine Ingham says, it, it's not that the nutrients are lacking in our soil. What is lacking is the biology and the organic matter to make those nutrients available because they're in the minerals in our soil. And so the organic matter in the, the, um, uh, the, the um, soil um, organisms, what they do is basically release enzymes and, and acids that release those um, nutrients from the mineral components in the soil. And, and we all know about myco mycorrhizal fungi and how plants will change the recipe that will change the root extrudates that the recipe that they put out through their roots um, according to what they would like, whether they want more phosphate or more nitrogen or whatever, whatever nutrient they want. And then, it, and then they, um, uh, the mycorrhizal fungi then supplies that to them. And there's a lot more obviously complexity happening in the system as well. But the result is we get well-nourished plants and we get abundant and vigorously growing, um, vigorously growing plants and well-nourished people because, because the plants have got all the nutrients that, that we need to, to grow healthy crops um, and, to, um, and to give those, pass those, those nutrients on to, to, people, to people in the products that we sell or we grow in our gardens. So in contrast, in, in um, when we have dysfunctional soil ecosystems, the soil infrastructure is inadequately maintained. We get in, inadequate nutrient supply to feed our plants. We get poor harvests and our crops need chemical or biological fertilizers to produce. And I'll just let you read um, this comment. And I, I, I think the nice thing about this is this um, emphasizes that when we delve down deep enough, that the message is quite simple. We just need to give our soil ecosystem a better diet. And it almost sounds too simple, but it's all of everything is, as Peter says, is, this is all backed up by 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 soil science, by the research. And so just 
so to get a functioning soil ecosystem, we need to have, we need to supply an adequate food supply to our soil ecosystem. And just to break it down and delve down a little bit deeper into that, in a way, there's two, two sources of food. There's the above ground and below ground. So the above ground supplies of organic materials are our leaves and our stubble, the mulch that we put on the ground, or even better, the leaves and plant debris that accumulates naturally from the, the plant biomass that we grow. But the important thing is, is that that, that um, organic material is recycled into the soil as organic matter. And that's where the incorporation of livestock into our system, in our grazing system is really important. And perm I gather there's some permaculturists um, participating today. And you know that's really what chop and drop is all about. It's about mimicking browsing animals to, to chop and drop that plant material onto the soil so it can be recycled in the soil as organic matter. And then of course, the um, other side of it is the, the below ground supplies of organic materials, the roots and root exudates. And um, interestingly, a lot of the science is now showing that if we want to increase soil carbon, the organic matter in our soil, we need to retain it in our soil for longer. And to do that, we need to have living plants that most of that carbon that gets retained in our soil does not come from above ground applications of mulch, for example. It comes from roots and root exudates. And I, it's something I know that we, we all sort of comment on when you put out mulch and, and then you say, where did that all disappear to? Well, it's, it's been broken down by the soil organisms and it's and it's been used in the nutrient recycling. So it's been used to refeed your plants. But in effect, the, these, the soil organisms have, have breathed out the carbon back into the atmosphere. So simply put, um, to um, get our soil ecosystems working better, to get our nutrient recycling system working better, but also to get our, a better soil structure, we need to give that, uh, improve the supply of food to the soil ecosystem. And that means about growing more plants, growing more vegetation as much of the year as possible to give up your soil ecosystem a consistent food supply. And you know that makes sense in terms of uh, maintaining the root exudate supply, maintaining the root supply, and obviously keeping that flow of, of um, organic debris on the surface of the soil and, and, it, and it's the process of it breaking down and adding in and being incorporated into the soil. Producing um, as much um, biomass as we, as we can to provide a generous start. And, um, and then lastly, a diversity. Um, so growing uh, plants with different root shapes, with different growth forms, um, enables us to provide a more diverse diet. And I've just put sort of an exclamation mark and more food outlets, because if we've got different shape group, um, roots, we're, we're pumping out those root exudates into, in more places uh, in, this, in our soil. And just to summarize, so we've only looked at one ecological component and that's about improving the functioning of our soil ecosystem. But as you can see here, what that also has is it provides extra benefits. So um, we know that we improve our soil structure. So we, we know that um, we get more, when we get a downpour, more of that initial water will be, in, will infiltrate into the soil, so it will reduce the flood surge, the initial flood surge. Um, it will also reduce, because we've got better soil structure, it will also reduce water logging. And we've already talked about the fact that we've got a better soil structure, we've got more organic matter in our soil, more soil carbon, we've got more water being stored in our, our soil and more water infiltrating our soil. Um, because we've got more carbon, we've got the opportunity to sequest carbon and and I'm sure um, you're all aware about the, all of the sort of amazing opportunities that we've got from um, in, to, to increase the carbon in our soil. 
Um, and I think what's interesting here is that, you know, while carbon giving farmers carbon credits for carbon sequestration is important, you know, it's it's there's a benefit there for the a direct benefit for the farmer in terms of their production systems as well, a direct economic benefit of having carbon in their soil or more carbon in their soil. And because we've got a functioning soil ecosystem, the, the soil ecosystem is healthier, we get less problems with, with, with pests and diseases um, and pathogens in our soil, but we also get healthier plants and so that they have more um, pest and disease uh, res resilience against pests and diseases. So applying the ecological principles, we have the know-how to get these crucial ecological components in our production systems functioning again. And, and I've just sort of summarized again what they are. We have the know-how to, by, and I, sorry, I should just say, by, by understanding the principles, we have the know-how to develop regenerative practices for our unique circumstances. We can trial techniques, we can learn and share our experiences, and we can respond constructively to emerging issues and threats. So in effect, by understanding the, I call it the ecologic, understanding why we're doing, using these regenerative practices, what we're trying to achieve, which is about getting these ecological components, getting these ecological functions happening again in our gardens and farms, we then start using regenerative practices as a source of, for, an in, of, for inspiration for our ideas rather than just recipes to follow. So what I'd like to do, we're going to, um, I'd just like to open it to any questions so far. And, um, and then what we're going to do is we're going to move on and look at some, some examples because um, uh, in relation to, um, then we're gonna sort of use those um, to uh, get us thinking a little bit more from when we break out into, into some, um, we're gonna divide up into groups and, um, and talk a little bit more about how we implement some of these principles in relation to soil. So any questions so far? Yeah, well, I might start off, uh, Wendy, if you can hear me okay. Yeah. Um, so if you've been farming in a conventional way, um, how do you start? Because it seems like, um, I think that's the most difficult part to look at. Yeah, and Peter, I think that's, it's an interesting, um, it is an interesting, um, you know, challenge. I. It, it's one that, um, you know, change is, is a challenge because we, um, if we keep doing what we've always done, we sort of think that it's, we're in a secure position, it's less risky. Oh. One of the interesting things is that um, there are ways when we initially make those changes to design the way that we do it so that we actually reduce our costs. And, and um you know, I, I was looking at um, some work done by Bruce Maynard just recently, and he's he does a version of pastured cropping. And he, because it, when we, a good a good example of this is is people who are doing broad acre cropping, so huge amount of investment into putting that crop into the ground, financial investment. And so you want to control it as much as possible. You want to use the inputs that you think you need in order to be able to be more certain of getting that yield at the end of it to cover your costs. But what Bruce said, which I think is really true is, and I think we can see that with the examples that we've spoken so far, is that when we start doing this, we can, we can actually reduce the costs of what we're doing. So, and, um, so if, if, like for example, with Colin Sice, He's putting in a, a crop into his pasture, and now he only uses one piece of machinery and doing one pass. His costs are reduced significantly. And as Bruce says, you know, that, that, that cereal crop comes up. And if it's good enough that you can harvest, then um, you, you incur the cost to harvest that 
crop. But if it's not good enough to harvest, then what he does is he actually uses it as an additional feed for his livestock. So because he's got the pasture and then he's got a, another layer in his production system, he's got the um, a cereal growing up above, above the grassland. So I think, you know, there's some interesting things about and there's some programs that I've seen that people are operating where they work with farmers and they say, OK, step number one, let's see how we can reduce your some of your costs. Um, and it could be, for example, I, I know a lot of the work that happens up here with cane farmers that they've shown that 60, about 60 percent of the fertilizers that they apply on their fields get get virtually immediately washed out of their fields with the heavy rain. And so people are working and saying, well, let's reduce that fertilizer use. And that way we can reduce some of your initial costs and use that to do some regenerative practices. But I think, I mean, one of the important things, um, Peter, is, about, is, is obviously about starting in a small way first and trialing things. And um, is it useful to use, say, a, a quality compost or a, a biological fertiliser to kickstart the process if you've been using a lot of chemicals and so forth? Yeah, if you have access to those, if you have access to mulch and compost, biological fertilisers, if your soil tests say that you could, you'd benefit from adding minerals, by all means, yes, do it. Um, it's in a way, it's a bit like kickstarting the regenerative process. But there's a couple of things to keep in mind that um, if you if you put on a biological fertilizer and a lot of that is about adding effective microbes, if the habitat isn't there for those microbes, the benefit will be short lived. The other thing, too, about a compost is that. Um, as I mentioned earlier, when we put on above ground applications of, of um, organic materials, including compost, the carbon in that material is used primarily in the nutrient recycling. So we don't get the long term benefits of the carbon, a build up in carbon in the soil. Using those um, things like compost great, but combine it with um, ad adaptations to your production systems or your, or, or your wh wh whatever scale you're growing at to increase the growth of plants, to increase the growth, the amount of root, root, root exudates and plant biomass that you're naturally um, supplying to your soil ecosystem. So use that, that compost as an initial boost. But if you don't combine it with a changed practice, a change in, 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 in the amount of vegetation that you grow and recycle in your soil, you're, you're tied in to, to keep having to, to, to use those um, uh, inputs. Does that answer your question? Yep, no, I think that's good. Okay, so uh, what we might do is, uh, I'll just ask anyone, has anyone in this little room got a, a question? Stuart? Yeah, Wendy, I haven't heard you talk here about um, native um, C4 perennial grains uh, for, for uh, you know, to grow, grow as a crop be much more efficient than our um, annual pastures and annual grain seeds. Definitely. If you can add perennials, I mean, obviously, we've only got a short time together today, so I'm working at sort of the principles, but but it's thank you for bringing that out. If, if, if we can grow perennial plants in our system, obviously, that's a way of... Um, going back to that simple di diagram about improving the food supply to our soil ecosystem, make it as consistent as possible. So if we're using perennials, we are we are maintaining that supply of roots, root headaches, organic matter into our soil um, for, you know, as, as, as a, a much longer period of time than, um, uh, you know, if, we, if we've got a, an annual plant. Um, you know, in relation to diversity, it's a really interesting thing that uh, when you, you know, in that section, when I talk about it in the handbook, I've got, I think about a third of the page is, is references. And it doesn't matter where you look at, what type of system that you're looking at. If we move from one or two species to sort of like five or six species, 
the benefits, the speed at which the, our, our production system, our soil improves, our ecosystem improves, just increases exponentially. So having that bar, having biodiversity and, and perennials, if you can create perennials, and certainly I'm moving towards that here. I'm, I had a, um, a market garden um, and, um, and it, was, it was a really high input system. And uh, I, I, I don't usually take things out. I've taken it out and I'm now concentrating. I'm really interested in developing perennial carbohydrate tree crops. So I'm growing lots of jackfruit, breadfruit, for example, um, plantain bananas, cooking bananas, those sort of things. Down there on the Victorian volcanic plain, we've got a lot of C4 grasses. And those perennials I, I would like to see used rather than um, you know, we've got a lot of problems with some of the introduced perennials, like the laris. Yeah, you, I don't know if you, you might not have a look at too, there's a lot of work that's going on perennial, looking at perennials and, 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 uh, and developing, uh, turning annuals into perennial species. I think it's called the Land Institute that works out of the USA. Um, so you might like to have a look at the work that they're doing. Thank you. And uh, one of the things we might... Uh, doing a, a future uh, session is uh, actually look at uh, getting Colin Sice to uh, speak to us. So um, we'll uh, look, look at doing that. Um, Kay's got a question. So my question is, uh, can you please just have a wee chat about the, the significance of having a reasonably good dung beetle population within your um, profile? Yeah, Kay, um, hello, nice to speak to you again. Um, it's, it's, I think it's just part of the bit that, that picture about um, dung beetles are um, an, an invertebrate that is helping us to incorporate that um, uh, organic matter into the soil. And obviously they're, they're great because they, they drag it down deep into the soil profile as well. So, um, yeah, so just another example of, 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 ha of a, when we have livestock in our system, um, I'm hearing an echo here, that we, um, the importance of integrating and getting that organic matter back into the soil ecosystem. So it's a great question because dung beetles are such a good example. So um, can plants capture the phosphorus from the soil, the subsoil, or how do we replace the, you know, the phosphorus from synthetics? Uh, so what, what, this, what the situation is that the phosphorus is often in, in our soil, phosphate is in our soil. And again, going back to, you know, what Elaine Ingham was saying is that it's what's lacking is, is the, is the biology to make those available. And we know, for example, that there are um, um, phosphate solubilizing bacteria in the soil, in the rhizosphere. And so a plant will change the recipe of the sugars that it produces to say to that bacteria, and it, and, and it probably does it to the fungus too, a mycorrhizal fungi, I'm, I'm pretty sure, but I, I can't guarantee that, but whatever. It's saying, I need more phosphate, can you bring it to me? And so a lot of soils, and I think that's where some of the problems is, is that we get a soil test done. And if it's just the standard test, it tells us what nutrients are readily available to our plants in, in our soil. If we go for the, 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 the other test where it sort of says, they usually say it's the total amount, it then measures what nutrients are available also in the organic component in our soil, but it still doesn't measure what's in the mineral components of our soil. So I know for a fact here that we've, that we have, this soil here has lots of phosphate in it, but without the biology, it's not available. And so I can spend a fortune on adding a whole lot of inputs, but what I'm more interested in is actually, how can I use, how can I use the plants to, to, um, to, to make that phosphate available? But it doesn't mean to say, like Peter was saying, you want to sort of add something to kickstart the system happening, by all means to do it. But there's a, not in relation to phosphate is, but as Christine Jones um, talks about, and she's an um, Australian soil scientist, you know, she sort of says, you know, with, with fertilizers and things like that, 
if we keep applying um, the fertilizer the, at, as the original rate, I mean, you don't want to stop using them immediately because you're just, you know, you've got to sort of wean yourself off. But, but as, while we keep putting nitrogen fertilizers on our soil, the plants will say, I don't need to produce those root exudates to get nitrogen and phosphate or whatever. So I, I want, so we don't get that improvement in the soil as quickly. So it's a balancing thing. And she suggests sort of reducing it by a third at a time. But we all have to sort of find our own way. It depends on, you know, our systems on how much money we're putting into to grow a crop or, you know, our scale of production. So does anyone anywhere have any further questions for Wendy? We've got one here from Stuart. A quick idea on um, Podolinsky and biodynamics, Wendy. Have you, you come across that system? Because my, my brother lectures and operates a biodynamic veggie farm with, with great success. And it looks like there's a lot of um, parallels with, with uh, what you're suggesting in terms of soil microbes. Yeah, and, and it's, I've, I've actually lived on a, and done biodynamic treatments. And I, I think biodynamics, it's a really interesting because you've got that whole side of it that, that scientists in a way, you know, the energy side that can't be measured. I think the interesting thing is how can we actually get our ecosystems functioning better so we don't need to rely on these inputs? So we can use them to kickstart, but we can actually get that so that the ecosystem is providing these free ecological services for us. It's about saying, how can we design our production systems? How can we modify them to so that we're not so reliant on um, substituting for these free ecological services with inputs? And Peter, you know, I, I wouldn't, if we have time, I've got a few, just a few couple of slides that I wouldn't mind sharing with people just to give, to, just to give people a little bit some more ideas about how they might be able to sort of modify what they're doing. I don't know if it would take about five minutes. Have we got time to do that? Yeah, absolutely. Wendy, that'd be great. Okay. All right. Well, I'm, I'll, I'll move on with that. So when we were going to do the breakout rooms, we were going to look at how we can modify our gardens and farms, our production systems, to improve the food supply to our soil ecosystem. So how can we get it so that we are providing our soil with everything that it needs from the plants that we grow um, in our production system. So, so grazing practices, well, we've talked about time controlled grazing and how that's important to in incorporate the organic matter in our soil. So growing forage crops and grains increases the amount of um, plant biomass that we're growing and therefore also the amount of plant biomass that's been recycled in our, in our soil. Silvio pasture, I mentioned that earlier, you know, this is, this is, I think, you know, something that we're totally underusing. There's a whole argument that the only way that we're going to feed the world is with industrial agriculture. There is one really simple solution. We just need to grow up. Farmers need to grow up, need to start exploring using the vertical space. Um, more on their production systems. And this is just an example of um, one of the systems from, you know, in the Mediterranean climate that there's, that's, a, it's a very traditional old system. But just to give you an example, his, his, um, uh, 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 a Silvio pasture system in the UK where, where often farmers will say to me, oh yeah, but we can't plant trees in our production systems. We don't have enough light in a temperate climate. But you just adjust the width. You just make sure the rows are running north, south. Um, you look at the canopy cover that your, your trees are gonna produce. This picture here is from um, Africa. It's from the Sahara. It's which is the belt on the southern part of the Sahara Desert. That is maize that is growing underneath a legume tree. And the locals there call it um, the they call it a fertilizer tree. But they acknowledge that they're getting more than just a bag of fertilizer from the equivalent, you know, replacement to a bag of fertilizer. They're now their grazing rates, they produce it, they're getting more higher yields for their grazing and higher yields from their cropping system by having an extra layer of trees within their production systems. And here's an example. This is um, that same tree 
and it's compared in maize um, yields um, where there is a canopy of those trees and where there isn't a canopy of those trees. In most of areas, sunlight is not lacking. We can get so many benefits by just bringing trees back into our another extra layer into our production systems. Horticulture, um, get some, some ground covers coming, you know, interplant shrubs and small trees, make them ecological, use ecological supports, plants use legumes, use, but, but also use maybe potentially crop plants. And then, which is grow open canopied trees above your main crop. And that's something that we're using a lot up here. I've got bananas. I'm getting sunburn damage to fruit. I don't know whether you're starting to get that down here. A neighbor and a good friend of mine, he's a commercial organic dragon fruit grower. He's doing the same things. And I, I know that, um, uh, you know, it, some of you may be involved or in, in your area that there's some, um, some vineyards. And I, I actually tried to find a photo of, um, of where people might have been putting trees and planting it to um, reduce, but not, not just reduce sunburn, but actually to, to reduce water loss, to reduce temperatures in vineyards. And, and I came across this and I thought, well, there's an interesting um, uh, outside the square bit of thinking. And that's, that's it. If you want some more resources, as I say, there's the Learning From Nature YouTube channel. There's some of our own videos, but more importantly, what I've done is, is what we've done is collated videos that we've tried to sort of be a sorting house of really good quality um, information and inspiring stories um, and put it into one place for you as a resource. Thank you. Wendy, we had a question come in from um, online um, yeah. asking if you could touch on water cycling, water flow management, use across pasture and swales. One of the things that we overlook, one of the simplest things we can do to, um, to drought proof our farms is about increasing the water infiltration and storage in our soil. And so I think that when we're looking at drought proofing, that should be like, that's the number, the first thing that we do, we look at. And then we've got, you know, tools like key line, like natural sequence farming, like permaculture swales that are, are, you know, earthworks that, that, that um, can help as well. But they, you know, they cost, um, they certainly do. I mean, um, natural sequence farming, uh, Peter is, is, is um, Andrews is very much talks about that it should be incorporated, incorporated with, with um, efforts to actually increase the growth of plants as well. Very good. Yes, that's a, a good hope, point to finish on. Um, a big thank you to Tim for, uh, you know, we've had some challenges here tonight and Tim's done a lot of the work uh, in the lead up to this. Uh, so yeah, once again, thank you very much, Wendy. Thank you for everyone for coming along.